Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Levy Lecture. My name is Wendy Cromash, and I am delighted to welcome you and to welcome our special guest, Akbar Imhotop. He is going to portray Frederick Douglass and tell the story of his life. This is a great way for us to be celebrating uh, Black History Month, as well as just getting smarter in general about things that probably weren't covered very well in our elementary and middle school educations. Akbar is a 2012 uh, recipient of the Georgia Governor's Arts and Humanities Award. He's been a professional storyteller since 1985 and has performed throughout the metro Atlanta and south uh, southeast regions. For the past 19 years, he's been a storyteller in residence at the Wren's Nest and is currently a Wren's Nest Rambler. When we have the Q&A, we can find out exactly what that is. Um, for six years, he's worked as a storyteller for Project Discovery at the zoo in Atlanta. And before he became a professional storyteller, he was a puppeteer in residence at the Center for Puppetry Arts, and he toured nationally with the Vagamon Marionettes. Um, so it's, it's great to have you with us. Uh, let me just make one or two announcements before we uh, go, go to your presentation. Uh, I wanna thank the Levy Senior Center Foundation for making this possible. Uh, they are the reason that we have the Levy Senior, the Levy Lecture Series and uh, thanks to contributions from generous donors in our audience, as well as support from the foundation, we're able to present this webinar series. I also wanted to remind people, if you are in need of this beautiful 100% cotton long sleeve t-shirt, perfect for this weather, $15, it's a great bargain. I have large and extra large. Get in touch with me if you're interested in purchasing one for yourself or a loved one. And without any further ado, uh, we are going to join now uh, Mr. Douglas in his parlor and hear the story of his life. Greetings, greetings everyone. It's a joy and a pleasure to be with you for just a moment today. I. Uh, The screen went blank, am I still on? You are still on. I am going to give you the stage uh, completely to yourself. So I am going to hide myself and mute myself, but I will be here watching and hearing everything. And if you need me, I'm right here, okay? Okay, let me just say, I, I can't see anything Is that intentional on your part. Uh, it's just easier for people to focus on you, but um, if you would like, hang on, let me, I can just minimize myself. Uh, is that better? No, my, my screen is blank, but it, but it seems like the camera's on, and so I'll just go ahead. I, I don't necessarily have to see myself as I talk. You are there. You are you are in the center of the screen. Okay. So let me let me introduce you again. Welcome everyone to Frederick Douglass's home. He's in his parlor, and he's going to be talking to us about his life, Mr. Douglas. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I began again by saying greetings to everyone. It's such a joy and a pleasure to be with you for just a moment. 
I'll begin by saying that my friends, Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth and Booker T. Washington, over on the other side of the river, wanted me to come back to tell you a little bit of how I became Frederick Douglass and also to see how things are progressing in the modern era. And now when I left here around 1895, when I left this side of the river, there was a struggle going on for women's right to vote. They called it women's suffrage. And I see as I come back, I've only been here for a minute, but I still see that there's struggles going on in many fronts. But I didn't come here to talk to you about that kind of stuff today. I come to tell you about how I became Frederick Douglass and how I got to do the things that history said I could do. And I can really sum it all up in one sentence. And that one sentence would be, by the grace mm -hmm. and mercy of the Most High. Now you can call that Most High whatever you choose to call him or her. But I know without them, I would not have been able to do any of the things that history says that I did. I want to begin with my childhood. I was born Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey. I was born around 1818. At least that's what I was told. There are no official records, but according to my grandma and other people around me, it was around 1818 or so. And so Around 1818, I was born in Tabard County, Maryland, near what they call the Eastern Shore. Now, my childhood was probably like many of yours in lots of ways, but in some ways, ways that you could not imagine. I grew up with my grandma and my grandpa in a log cabin out in the woods away from the big house, they called it. And our cabin had dirt floor floor. When it came to clothes, me and the other children, we didn't get any big clothes, clothes like pants and stuff, till we were six, seven, eight years old. So that early, early part of my life, me and everybody wore like long shirts that don't know, you know, from a kind of like a gown like thing. Girls and boys didn't make no difference. We all wore the same type thing when we was that age. Now, as a child, I played games that I'm sure probably some of you played. Uh, we played tag. We played hide and seek. And when we got tired of playing tag and hide and seek, we just made up games. Now, I got to swim in a pond not too far from the cabin. I don't know how many of you guys and girls got to swim in the pond, but that was one of the joys of my childhood. Now in our dirt floor cabin, grandma and grandpa used to talk a whole lot about old master. Now I didn't ever see old master, but he must have been a pretty mean fella, the way grandma and grandpa talked about him and the things that was happening on the plantation. Now, when I was about five, grandma said, Frederick, we gotta go visit old master. And when grandma told me that, grandpa had a sad look on his face. And when me and grandma got to leave, grandpa gave me a hug, like I would be gone for a very long time. Well, me and grandma, we walked that five miles from our cabin all the way to the big house. And when I got there, I saw more grown folks than I'd seen my whole life. There was also a lot of children there. And when we went to the gate, there was a group of children sitting over on a little bench or something, log or something. And grandma said to me, she said, Frederick, there she says, Sarah, and there's another sister, Eliza, and the little boy back in the corner, that's your brother, Perry. Go play with her. And she kind of nudged me over to go play with her. Well, I didn't really know them, 
And I, I didn't really want to play. I just wanted to be with my grandma. But when I turned to go back to see grandma, she was gone. I said, grandma, grandma. But she was gone. And all I could do was cry. The other children came around me and they said, Frederick, don't cry. Come on and play with us. Well, eventually I stopped crying and I went ahead and started playing with the children. And me and all the children, we were under the care of a lady they called Aunt Katie. Some called her Aunt Katie. She wasn't really nobody's aunt, but that's what they called her. To me, she was more like Witch Katie. The way she tried to keep us in order and make sure we did everything she said us do. And then the worst of all, the way she fed us. When she put our food out, she put it in a trough. And as children, when we had to eat up at the big house, we had to go to that trough and eat as much as we could, as fast as we could from that trough. Well, I said, I tried to pay her back. She had, she would go to the garden or out to the orchard and she would bring back fruit from the orchard or maybe vegetables from the garden. And one day I went into the kitchen and I saw that she had some apples and things up on the windowsill. So I grabbed one of them apples and I ran away from that house. I ran all the way down through the woods to my secret hiding place. And as I was about to bite into that apple, I heard a voice say, Frederick, Frederick. I looked up and it was my mama. <laughs> yeah, my mama who I hadn't seen in a long, long time. So I went over to her and I said, mama, mama, take me with you, mama, please. Please, mama, please take me with you. My mama looked me in the eye. She said, Fred, I can't take you with me. You take care of yourself. Mind your elders and stay out of trouble. And then she kissed me on the cheek and she left me. That was the last time I saw my mama. She died just before I turned seven years old. Well, after I turned seven, they cleaned me up real nice and gave me trousers for the first time. It was my first time not wearing that long gown like thing and being able to wear pants like a big boy, even like a man. And I got my little pants and I fastened them up and I just strutted my little butt around that plantation like I was somebody. Little did I know that my days at the big house would soon be over. You see, old master, also known as Colonel Edward Lloyd, had a plan for me. But I should tell you a little bit about who this Colonel Edward Lloyd is and the impact that it had on my life and hundreds and hundreds of others. You see, he was the Lord and King, Lord and Master of his kingdom. And what was his kingdom? Almost the state of Maryland. I say that because he was three times elected governor of Maryland. He owned about 10 farms and he owned more than a thousand Africans who worked those farms. Now, one of those farms was managed by his son-in-law, Thomas All. And I will I mention this name because he's going to come up many times during the, the story and the progression of my life. Thomas All, son-in-law of Old Master, a.k.a. Colonel Edward Lloyd. 
Now, after I turned seven and got those pants, Colonel Lloyd sent me Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey as a gift to Thomas R's brother, Hugh, who lived in Baltimore with his wife and grandson. Now, the grandson was actually Colonel Edward Lloyd's grandson. So let's see what happened. I'm in Baltimore. That's after I turned seven. When I was about nine or 10, Sophia all, the wife of Hugh all, started giving me reading lessons. And I, I was really enjoying it. We got through the two letter words and then we went on up to three letter words and I was able to read sentences and knew what they meant and everything. And one day, when Hugh all came home early from work and saw that Miss Sylvia was teaching me how to read, he knocked the book out of her hand and said, don't teach him to read. And she asked, why not, honey? He said, if you teach him to read, he'll be no good to me as a slave. So don't ever give him a reading lessons again. You hear me? Yes, I hear you. Now, when he all commanded her not to give me reading lessons, this only made me want to learn how to read even more. And I would ask Miss Sophia to teach me how to read. And she would fuss at me. She would say, you know I can't do that. My husband don't want me to give you no reading lessons. So don't ever ask me to do that again. Now I'm the kind of fellow, you tell me I can't do something, I'm gonna keep on trying till I do it. Now when I would run errands into the city, there were some white boys that I would interact with. And all of them can read and add and subtract and multiply and all of that. And I didn't know how to do none of them. Well, shouldn't say none of them. I can read a little bit, but I didn't know nothing about adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing. And I made them a deal. I told them that I would bring them fruit and food from the big house or from the huge house if they would give me reading lessons. And they agreed. We shook on it and everything. And we did it. Every time I had to run an error and stuff, I'd take some extra vegetables or extra fruit or maybe sometimes that's some bread. And I would give it to them. And they give me reading lessons. Taught me how to add, subtract, and multiply and all of that. Oh man, it was great. And I really enjoyed those boys. And Matter of fact, I, I want to show you the first book that I had of my own. It was a book called The Columbia Art. And this was a book with essays. It also has ways of how to make speeches. And it has speeches by people like George Washington and Ben Frank. Oh, it's the most wonderful book. This became my favorite book until later on, I came across this book. Now, some people call it the Holy Power, Holy Bible. I call it the good book. And after the Columbian Orator, it went much, no, I got to change the order. The Columbian Orator was my first book, but this book right here became my favorite book. And we'll get into that later. So now I'm an agent going into my teenage years. I've learned how to read. I've learned how to add, subtract, multiply, and divide. And what he all decides to do is to send me to his brother Thomas's plantation. You see, I didn't know nothing about being a slave. And he all thought it was high time for me to learn how to be a slave like I was born to be. At least that's what he thought. 
So he sent me to Thomas All, his brother, plantation. Now, to be honest, even though I've been my slave folks when I was a child, saw them working in the cotton fields and whatnot, I never experienced that on my own as a big boy, as a teenager. So I wasn't used to working from sun up to sundown, picking cotton, cutting the back of, and in Thomas All's world, world, our world, I was a very poor slave. And he was determined to make me a better slave. He would whip me, but it didn't make no difference. I still was a poor cotton picker. I was worse as a tobacco cutter. So he decided to send me to a slave breaker or a slave maker, however you want to look at it. He sent me to the plantation of a man named Edward Covey, who had the reputation of a slave breaker. And this is what they said about Edward Covey. They said, if you made it back from his plantation, you would never be the same. Now, when he sent me there, he won't. When he sent me there, I was determined to come back in my right mind. And I was determined to read everything I could get my hands on. And we didn't have no incidents to everything. I, the whole thing about being him, being a slave breaker, I, I didn't really know what that mean until one day. He wanted me to take a team of oxen and a wagon and go pick up something from another farm. Now, as I was going up the road with that team of oxen, they broke free from me, broke free and ran through the woods, broke the wagon and just destroyed it. And then they ran on in the woods. I had no idea what it was. So I knew I was in trouble. So I just sat down on the stump, trying to figure out what I should do. Should I just run away now? Or should I go back and tell Edward Kobe that I lost control of the oxen and they destroyed the wagon and ran away? So as I sat there on that stump, a fellow from another plantation come up the road. And he saw me sitting there. He said, hey, boy, what's the matter with you? I said, I was driving the wagon and the oxen ran away and they tore up the wagon and I don't know where they went. And I, I don't want to go back to the Kobe plantation. And he said, look, I got something for you. And so he told me his name. His name was Sandy Jenkins. And he reached into his pocket and he pulled out some, some old roots and whatnot. And he gave them to me and he said, look, keep this on you at all times. And as long as you keep this on you, there's nothing nobody can do to harm you. Well, I, I didn't necessarily believe in all that root stuff and whatnot, but if anything was gonna keep me from being harmed, I was willing to give it a shot. So I thanked him for giving me the high John the Conqueror route. And I made my way back up to the Kobe plantation. And when I went there, I, I told him, I said, Miss Kobe, the oxen ran away and, they, and destroyed the wagon, and I'm sorry. And he said, that's okay, Frederick. We'll take care of everything later. Well, a couple of days later, he told me to go into the stable to take care of the horses. And when I looked up, he was coming into the stable with the whip. He came in there with that whip and I looked at him. He looked at me. And then he took the whip and he 
tried to swing at it to hit me, but I grabbed it. And when I grabbed it, I jumped it out of his hand. Now, this, you know, this really upset him. So he came to me to get it back. And I put it behind my back. And he swung at me. I blocked it. I swung at him and he blocked me. Well, he hit me. And then I hit him back. And we went, we grabbed hold of each other and we start wrestling around in that stable, falling all down on the ground and everything. And he started, come help me, come help me, come get him off me, come get him off me. When well, other fellas there on the plantation, some of them came into the stable, but none of them grabbed hold of nobody. They just let us wrestle around there until he got tired. And when he got tired and realized that he couldn't beat me, this is what he said. Okay, 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 boy, let's stop. I'm tired of beating you now. So you go on, get on out of here. No, no, he didn't beat me. He got beat. And furthermore, he couldn't tell anybody that a young slave fought him and beat him. Yeah, and at that point, I lost my fear of men and everything. No, nobody else was gonna ever whip me again. That was my commitment to myself. Well, now that that happened on the plantation, on the Kobe plantation, in front of other, other slaves on the plantation, he had to send me away so I wouldn't be no example for them. So he sent me to the Freedland Plantation. And I tell you, the Lord always has a master plan. Because Mr. Freedland was nothing like Edward Tobin. He was a truly religious man. He let me read the Bible. He let me teach Sunday school. He even let me teach the other slaves how to read. And a few of us formed a little clique. And we started planning our escape. Now, one of the main thing about the escape was we needed free papers. So at first, I didn't know what we was going to do about having free papers. But then I realized that I could write up the free papers on my own. And that's what we did. I made up free papers for each one of us. And we set the day for our escape. And on the day we were planning to escape, Sandy Jenkins, the same one who gave me the Haji on the Cockroach, said to me, Frederick, I think I'm going to stay here. I think the people need me more here than I need to be out there. So you all go on with your plan, but I'm going to stay here. And so we said, okay. So me and the others, we went ahead with our plan. That morning, we went out into the field. We started doing our work, waiting for the time to make our run. And just before it was time to make our run, I looked up. And saw two fellas on horseback coming towards us with some young colored boys in front of the horses. And one of them rode up right to me and one of the fellas I was going to stay with. And he said, Frederick, we got word and you and a couple more are going to try to escape today. So you don't get in no trouble now. We want you and you. And he pointed to a third one over to the side, I want all three of you to come with me. Well, I never could figure out how they knew we was going to escape. But I'd hate to think it was Sandy. But somehow, they find out. They took us to jail. And at that point, I didn't know if I was going to die or be sent to Georgia which some people say may have been worse. And again, the Lord always has a master plan. And what happened, Mr. Freeland 
end up sending me back to Hugh and Sophia all. Now I'm in my late teenage years and Hugh all think I need to figure out how to make some money. So he sent me down to the shipyard. And some of the men down at the shipyard taught me how to caulk boats and whatnot. Now this caulking is, is just a fancy word for sealing. But it's a special kind of sealing. You have to use cotton, hemp, and tar. And you might say, well, what were you sealing? At the shipyard, we were sealing boats. You see, the boats are made from wooden planks. And you had to seal those planks so the boat wouldn't sink. And I learned how to do that. And I ever made a few dollars. And when I'd make a few dollars, I'd go back to the house. And Hugh all would ask me, did I make any money? And I said, yeah, I, I made a few dollars. And he said, give them to me. What? Give me the money you made. But it's my money. No, Frederick, it's not your money. You belong to me, and anything you earn belongs to me. Now give it to me. So regretfully, I, I gave him the money. But this just made me only want to be free even more. And so we kept going to the shipyard, and I richly met a free colored woman named Anna Murray. Now, Anna Murray kind of took a liking to me, and I, to be honest, I, I took a liking to her. Now, she was free, like I said. And she said, Frederick, if you want to be free, I'll help you get free. I'll make you a sailor's uniform. See, during that time, it wasn't unfamiliar to see colored, three colored men in sailor uniforms. She said, I even can, got a few dollars saved up and I can let you have some of them to help you get free. So of course I thanked her and we started planning for my escape. She made me the sailor uniform and I set a date for my escape. Now on the night I was to escape, I slipped away and I went through the woods. And when I heard the train coming, I ran and jumped on the train. Now jumping on that train was only the first step. I still had to take a ferry. I had to take a second train. I had to take a, a steamboat and a third train, train. And that third train would get me to freedom. So on the next to escape, Made it, made it through that first stop. Got on the ferry. Came to the second stop. Caught that second train. And when I got to the second train, the conductor called somebody over to look at my free pay. He looked at them a while, and then he told me to go ahead and sit back. Got to the third stop. Got on the steamboat. Now on this boat, there was a white fella who didn't think I should be on it. And he wanted to fight me. And I was willing to fight him. But the people pulled us back. We got separated and I made it to that four stop. And at the four stop, I jumped on that third train. And a few hours later, I was in New York City. Yeah, I was free. As free as a one-way slave can be. And as fate would have it, I ran into Willie Dixon. Now, Willie Dixon was a runaway slave who I had worked with years ago on the Thomas All Plantation. And he said, Frederick, there's something out here called the Fugitive Slave Law. And what that mean? if someone thinks you a runaway, they could take you to court and the court could decide to send you back to 
slavery, whether you must free or not. So you be careful. You be careful because there are slave churches and there are people who are out here who are helping the slave catchers, colored and white. So I think a short while after that, he introduced me to David Ruggles, R-U-G-G-L-E-S. And David Ruggles was a conductor on the Underground Railroad. Now I'm sure many of you have heard of the Underground Railroad. You probably have heard of Harriet Tubman. But there's another name I'd like for you to be familiar with as well. And that name is William Grant Steele. Now, there's William Grant Steele, the father, and there's William Grant Steele, the son. The son, he was a music composer. But William Grant Steele, the father, was a free colored man from Philadelphia. And they say, that he helped to start the Underground Railroad. So you know, Harriet, I challenge you to do a little research on William Grant Steele. Well, now I'm situated with David Ruggins. David asked me if I had any skills. I told him I, I knew how to call boats. And he said, Frederick, there's, there's lots of work in Bedford, Massachusetts. You can find work as a conquer up in New Bedford. So I sent for Anna Murray and we got married. And another thing that happened was I changed my name from Andrew, uh, Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey to Frederick Johnson. You probably never heard of that stuff. But when I got to New Bedford, I changed it from Johnson to Douglas. And that was because almost every other person I met was also a Johnson. Now, Anna Murray and I, we started our family and things started really happening for us. And I found out about these ab abolitionist meetings. And just on a whim, I started going. And the people at these meetings would, would talk about how bad slavery was and what they need to do to end slavery, but to be truthful. None of the people talking about it and ever been enslaved or enslaved. A fellow at those meetings by the name of William Lloyd Garrison heard that I, had, that I was a runaway slave. And he asked me to share my story with the people. And I said, no, Mr. Garrison, I I'm not, I'm not too good at talking to a big crowd. He said, Frederick, all you have to do is talk from the heart. And so he continued to ask me. And one night I finally said, okay, I'll do it. And so he went up and introduced me and called me up. And I told the people my story. And when I finished, there wasn't a sound. And then I, I heard a hand clap. And then there were more. Pretty soon, the whole audience was standing up clapping. And that was the beginning of my speaking career that night. Matter of fact, I started speaking so much that I got too popular. I guess in this day and era, you would call it overexposure. And my friends said, oh, Frederick, you need, to, you need to slow down. Matter of fact, we think you need to leave the country because you're doing all, these, all this speaking. Somebody going to come and get you, man, and send you back in the slave. And I followed their advice. And I left our country and I went over to England where I spoke on the end of slavery in England. I spoke about it in Scotland. I spoke about it to everybody who wanted to hear about it. And some of the people that I met in England and Scotland, they put money together 
and they bought my freedom from Thomas Hall. So when I came back to America, I came back as a free man. I reunited with my wife and I continued speaking. I published the North Star with the help of my friends from England. And I kept on doing the things that the creator wanted me to do. And I ended up being asked to come visit President Lincoln at the White House. And we went and talked. We, we talked about the Civil War and all of that kind of stuff. And I said, Mr. Lincoln, you need to let the free colors help you win this war. And he told me that that wasn't really something that he could do, but he would think about it. And so I went on back to my business, publishing the North Star, speaking. And then I, I guess they made us a decision to have free colors in the war. And, and to keep my word to him, my son was some of the first to join the Union Army. Well, we kind of know how that turned out. The war ended, but I don't, I'm not going to say things went back to normal. There were still battles to be fought on different fronts. I got involved in the women's suffrage movement. And people would ask me, Frederick, how long are you going to be in this don't go women's rights movement? And I said, until every one of my sisters, black and white, get the right to vote. It reminded me of something Harriet had told me when I asked her how long she was going to keep going back to the South. And she said, as long as I have a brother and sister that wants to be free, I would keep going back. And it's how I felt about the women's suffrage movement. As long as there was women wanting the right to vote, I was going to work to help them get it. Now, as enthusiastic as I was about it, I ended up having disagreement with the leaders. And so, you know, you never know why disagreements come up between you and people working for the same cause, but it did. And I had to pull back a little bit. But I kept working. I ended up, I, did some work for the Freedoms Bureau. I did some work for the Freedoms Bank. I got to be the recorder of deeds and a marshal in DC. I even got a little political position. I, I was uh, ambassador to Haiti for a minute. And I tell you this last little thing. I was in New York City one day and the daughter of Thomas R. You remember him? He was the plantation owner where he all sent me to learn how to be a slave. Well, we later in life now, and his daughter says to me, Frederick, daddy want to see you. I said, why he want to see me? She said, I, I think he want to ask you for forgiveness. Now, I don't know about you, but if someone invited you back, to a place where they had tried to make you into a better slave, would you be willing to go back? Well, I thought about it and I decided to go because I wanted to face Thomas all as a free man. So I went and when I got back to the place, the plantation where I had been as a teenager, it looked like a tornado had gone through it. The buildings were falling down. There were no crops. There was dead limbs and dead trees every which way. There was nothing like the plantation I had known in my youth. And I rolled up close to the house and I walked up onto the porch and sitting over to the side in a rocking chair 
was Thomas R. And as you saw me walking towards him, he looked up and said, thank you, Frederick. Thank you for coming back to see your old man. He said, Frederick, everything's gone. My crops gone. My place falling down. My people gone. And with the little life I have left, Frederick, I want to ask you for your forgiveness. Will you forgive me? And I looked at him and I said, let me think about it. I nodded, I went back and I left that plantation, master of my faith and captain of my own destiny. And so I draw my, con my conversation with you to a close. But I do have some pictures that I would like to show you of some of the things that I talked about. Let me see my, some of my descendants show me how to work this little device and I'm gonna see if I can pull it up. Let me put on my glasses here. All right, got a few things here. Just wanna show you. Uh... Okay, we have lots of questions. Well, first of all, let me say, that was a marvelous summary of your life. And thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, You're welcome. Uh, what references did you use to prepare this? I primarily used uh, the narrative of my life by Frederick Douglass. That was my first source. And then I would, I would Google stuff. <laughs> I would Google stuff on the internet. And then I would uh, somehow be led to different articles and things. And so I have several documents that I use, you know, for my script. Okay. And um, I would recall reading you you wrote three different autobiographies. Yeah, that helps me. I, this one that I'm holding is the first book that he wrote, Narrative of My Life. And then there's bondage, My Bondage and My Freedom. And there's a third one that I, that I actually own, but I can't remember the name of it. Okay. Um, I think I can stop sharing now. This, we're, we're good here. Um, do you know anything about your father? Uh, about my father? Yes. Well, they say his name was uh, Captain Tony. I, I know very little about him other than that. You know, he never was a part of my life in any way, shape, form, or fashion. So there's really very little was that he, I can tell our audience about him. Was he a slave as well? No, no, no. Captain Tony was a, well, it says ship captain, but he, he probably was a plantation owner. As a matter of fact, he was. Seemed like captain was a name that went with plantation owners or any white man in control or something. So he, he was a plantation owner who impregnated my mother. Okay, and the children that your grandfather mother pointed out to you when you went up to the big house, were those children that your mother had given birth to as well? Yes, my mother, yeah. Now, I don't know if Captain Tony was the father of them as well. Not, you know, like grown folks didn't share that kind of information with you until you got older. Did your mother live at the big house? No, my mother had been sent to another place. Okay. And in, in all of these things that I read, now I grew up in the country, right? And uh, they say five miles, they say 12 miles. But honestly, I think the mileage is off. Five miles is a long way. Right. And there's a point where Frederick said that his mother lives 12 miles away. And she would slip away. 
from the other plantation come over to see him like she did and then go back before sunup. Now, I don't know how long it takes to walk 12 miles. But I, I'm just saying, it seems like people are very generous with miles. Okay. As a country boy, I walk some long country roads and none of them were 12 miles long. Okay. okay. Um, when you got to New York, how did you know where to go? Well, you know, you just kind of find your way around. The good thing was I, I met Willie Dixon. And Willie Dixon kind of showed me this place, that place. And it actually ended up connecting me with David Ruggles. And after I got connected with David Ruggles, David was kind of my guy. On my, on my eyes, uh, telling me where to go and where not to go. Okay. Um, what happened to your children? Oh, my children grew up and had great lives. Matter of fact, when my children grew up and had great lives, and I'll tell you this little fact, one of my grandchildren actually married into Booker T. Washington's family and stuff. So great. I did what I could, and a lot of them followed my example. And pretty much all of them had wonderful life. That's great. And where did you um, spend most of your life as a free man? Which cities were you living in? Well, I, I lived between Washington, D.C. and Rochester. Matter of fact, that's where everything kind of ended up. But I spent a lot, I, I got to do lots of government appointed things, like being recorded deeds for DC, serving as ambassador to Haiti, working with the Freedmen's Bureau. See, all that was based in Washington, DC. But somehow, Anne and I ended up in Rochester, New York, where we kind of came to the final chapter of my life. Okay. Uh, did you ever meet Henry Ward Beecher or his sister, Harriet Beecher Stowe? Yes, I did. I met her. I met Susan e. Anthony. And I met, uh, what was the lady, Elizabeth Stanton Caddy or something? Mm -hmm. All of them. As well as Ida B. Wells, Barnett. You know, when, when you're on that speaking circuit, you get to meet people all the time. Sometimes only briefly. But then sometimes you meet them again and again. And so, yeah, I did meet some other people involved in the struggle as well. Okay. How uh, did you meet your wife? <laughs> How did I meet my wife? And I'll just remind the audience I'm talking about the first wife. I was going down to the shipyard and she was a spring colored woman. And you know, you, you walk past people and some of them are meant to be in your life and some are just people that you just see for a moment. And there was something about Anna Murray that just touched my heart. And we uh, walked past each other a couple of days speaking, hi, how you doing? And then we had a conversation and I found out she was a free woman and she found out I wanted to be free. So I'll say I met her while going to work. And my going to work to the shipyard brought us together. And I was ashamed to share some of my life with her. And then she became a part of my forever life. Like with many people. She was extremely generous. Uh, yeah. <laughs> she was a free colored woman and I guess she wanted to help me be free too okay. and within whatever means and ways that she could do that she was willing to do it that's wonderful 
Um, how is it possible for you to become a free man in England and have it accepted in the colonies? Uh, ask me again, I missed part of the early part. Okay. When you went to England, you went as a free man. Um, how did you become a free man in England or were you free before you, you went? No, I, I, I was a runaway slave when I went to England. I was a runaway slave who had been on the speaking circuit for a while. And so I guess, you know, good news travels, whatever. And, and the people in England knew that I went back to America as a runaway. There was a possibility that I could be sent back into slavery. And so to keep that from happening, they raised money to purchase my freedom in America. Didn't have to do it in England. And you're, I guess, the person who, you know, owned you at that time, accepted the money and... Yes. You know, I was such a poor slave that I guess any kind of money that they could get for me made it a worthwhile transition. And not only that, I was a runaway slave. I was no longer in, in their control. Okay. But see, even though I was out of their control, they still had ownership of me. So if I was caught by the fugitive slave law, I could be sent back to him. How uh, was the meeting yeah. with President Lincoln arranged? Do you hear? Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm here. I can hear you. How was the meeting with President Lincoln arranged? I'm, I'm going to mute and then answer. Can you hear me? Akbar, can you? Well, I was getting static. Okay, now you can ask me again. Okay. How was the meeting Lincoln arranged? How did that happen, that you met President Lincoln? Now, you asked me something I really don't know the ABC to, but I do know this. The invite didn't come, like, I didn't run into President Lincoln on the street. <laughs> it was the kind of thing of President Lincoln's people talked with my people, and I ended up going to the White House. Did you go by yourself? Did Yes, I did. I okay. didn't go with an entourage. I went by myself. Okay. We talked person to person. Matter of fact, there was nobody in the room but us. No when you were in Europe, uh, did you also go to Ireland? I think, yeah, I did. went to Ireland. I, I, went, I definitely went to Scotland. I went to Ireland, talked a lot in England. But those are the three places I remember prominently. Ireland, <laughs> Scotland, England. Okay. And um, when you were the um, the envoy to Haiti, did you also go to visit the island of Haiti? Oh, yes, I did. Yes, I did. Okay. And, uh, I, you know, I guess you know, there's so many things happening in the political world. I don't know what qualified me to be an ambassador, but I was the link, so-called link between America and Haiti. Now I said ambassador, the term they use are like minister, or I guess liaison. Okay. Did Anna go with you? Did, who go with me? Did Anna go with you, your wife? Yes, she did. Okay. Can you talk more about the Underground Railroad? Oh, the Underground Railroad. 
Yeah, I guess then. A lot of times when we talk about this underground railroad, we end up talking about it as things that a lot of people have heard of. But I'll just go back to basic. Underground Railroad was this network of safe places that once you ran away from one place, you can take a journey or travel to another place. And the, the safe places or stations for the Underground Railroad will protect you and help you get to the next place. Of course, they started in the deep south. Or it started in the deep south and went all the way to the north and if necessary, to get you over into Canada. So, uh, I, well, I'm, I know I'm talking to adults, so it wasn't like railroad tracks. Right. More like hiding places to help you safely get from one place to another. And the stops on the on the Underground Railroad, were those white and black families that were helping you? Were the only black family? White no. and black. White and uh, white and black, mostly white. Okay. Did you travel and do a lot of speaking with Sojourner Truth? With who? Sojourner Truth. Oh no. Sojourner kind of had her path and I had my path, and there would be times where we would be on the same program, same event, but we didn't necessarily travel together. Okay. Um, can you touch on your differences with William Lloyd Garrison? Well, in hindsight, it's kind of ironic. William Lloyd, even though I would have been born in slavery, and escaped it. I didn't necessarily want to tear down everything <laughs> to make everything right. William Lord Garrison and those close to him really wanted to just tear up the Constitution and rebuild America from the ground up. And I wasn't that radical. I wanted my people to be free, but I didn't necessarily think that the solution was tearing the country down and then rebuilding it. That was fundamentally our difference. And, and yeah, let me, let me just end there. Okay. That was how much change do we want to make? <laughs> okay. Um, what inspired you to publish the North Star? Oh, you have to get the word out. You know, you can do things like I'm talking to you and a few other people today, but when you put it in print, first of all, you can broadcast it more broadly. And then the other thing, one people may read that paper and it may go to somebody else and that some people, that person passes on to someone else. The Broad Star, the North Star, was my desire to spread the word as far and as wide as our resources would allow. Okay. Um You published the North Star um, as, were, was your audience, did you, how was your audience, your black audience, um, how, how did you know that they could read because you had had such difficulty? Well, uh, primarily, primarily my audience were um, whites who could read. <laughs> and black free colors. Okay. And it's like distributing anything. You have, you have an idea of who your target market is and you want to get it to them. Okay. At that point, you know, 
beyond the people who were actually in slavery fighting, the main other people were people outside of slavery who was helping to end it. So you, you, the purpose of the North Star was to bring in, you know, more engagement to encourage people to get in the fight, to end slavery by any means necessary. Did, did you ever imagine, you know, looking back on your life that you had uh, been forbidden to learn how to read, uh, that you would end up being the publisher of a newspaper? It's, it's kind of an amazing, miraculous journey. Never imagine. It all gets back to what I said in the very beginning. If you ask me how did I come to do the thing that history says that I did, it all gets back to the grace and mercy of the Most High however you please to call them him or her by whatever name. Born in slavery, growing up as a child on a dirt floor, being sent from the big house where we ate food from a trough. Unbelievably cruel. In Baltimore, where the wife teaching me how to read and is forced to stop. And then running into boys as I ran errands who continue to teach me how to read. There was no way as a child in a log cabin with no floor could imagine that. Um, Frederick, how did you, um, what kind of faith did you have as a, as a child? Were your grandparents religious? Or how did you come to have such a spiritual connection? Well, I guess it was just on the basis of the good people that I would meet. Of course, you know, in slavery, most of the people believed in, in a God, that some God force was going to get us through this. And then there were, there were ministers who came to preach what the plantation owners wanted us to know. And after reading the Columbia Origin, and then getting my hands on a copy of the good book myself. I was able, I, I dare say, internalize that and believe with all my heart, mind, and soul that our destiny was, the, was in charge of. And so I, I, I guess. And as, as a young adult, and being aware of this book, my, my spiritual beliefs just kind of evolved. So what do you attribute this tremendous self-confidence that you have? Well, I think it goes back to when I had that fight with Edward Curry, Edward Colby. See, up until that point, I was, I was a person, just a little child, and then a teenager, going through the world, knowing that as a, a slave, that stuff could be taken from me, stuff, people that I loved and care about could be taken from me, and I had no right that any white man would ever respect. That's how I felt. But then we had that fight. 
And we had that fight, and he hit me, and I hit him back. And we wrestled there, and we wrestled there, and he called people to help, and they let us fight. Now, but, let me just interrupt you a second. The people who are watching, were those other slaves, or were they also his white? No other slaves. There were people. No other, no other white people. No other white people. We were in the stable. This little fact thing happened. He called for help. Other slaves came to see what was happening. And at the end of that fight, when he said, I'm tired of whipping you, gone, that's when my confidence came. No, you didn't win this fight. I won this fight. And I'll never be afraid of you or any other white man ever again. And that non fear went both ways, physically, and intellectually. Okay, and um, the cause, what, what precipitated the beating was the fact that you had lost the oxen and the oxen had gotten, had ruined the wagon. And that man that saw you sitting there gave you that item that would protect you. Did you have that item with you when you had the fight? Yes, I did. And do you think there's any connection between having that item in your pocket and the confidence that you felt uh, enabling you to strike back? And you know, my, my, my quick answer is yes. And, you know, we, we believe in a lot of things. And so when Sandy told me, as long as I carry this, no one will be able to harm me. I, I didn't really believe it. You know, I, I just took it out of respect. And then I go back and the plantation owner swings at me with the whip. Not only did I not cower, and get down, I grabbed the whip and snatched it out of his hand. So different things, different words even, have a way of giving us strength and beliefs that we did, may not have had before we heard the words, I held the idol. Okay. How did I get my confidence? Even to stand before a highly educated class group when I was an escaped slave, that came from somewhere. That took courage. And so I, I was able to do it and then when I just told my story and felt this appreciation, I was inspired to go on because it had to be done. It worked two ways. People wanted me to do it. I felt that I could do it and I wanted to do it. Where I was before, I had no intention of standing before a group and telling them my story. Was it this? Was it him or her? Or was it, I think it's a combination. Absolutely. Um, was your wife, Anna, born free? You know, Anna and I never really talked about that. And it's the funny thing about three colors. Sometimes there were people who literally bought their freedom and they were, they were pronounced free. 
that, that she couldn't have been free because she was born to a free colored woman. But we never really talked about how she became a free colored woman. Okay. Our relationship and our joining each other just kind of ruled the conversation. Okay. And when I get back to the other side, I may just ask her. Okay, you do that. Um, how did you acquire all the, the photos, um, photos of slaves and uh, you know, I come back here, and, you know, I have many generations of descendants. And these generations of descendants have collected things about me. And as I prepared for this little talk with you today, they helped me to put together this little thing they call the presentation. So not only could I use my words, I could also show some pictures. It's been said a long time that a picture is worth a thousand words. Right. And so I, I embrace that. Um, I have many compliments. Uh, people are so grateful for this presentation. Um, they feel like they've met you. Uh, just uh excellent and i will uh communicate those to you privately uh but you have some friends from atlanta who've tuned in who uh are sending their regards and uh there's just appreciation from all over thanking you for your time um i have one one last question for you when you know you're you're here now and you're looking at the history that has taken place since you as you call it passed over what what surprises you what um, are you are you surprised are you disappointed are you, no, I, my, my life is, was, was too blessed and has been too blessed to be disappointed. And I see this thing as, as, a, as a continuing, evolving journey. And so I can be disappointed that many people are still battling for this, that voting right, this, that, and the other. But I, I, have, I have to look at it from a generation of people who ain't food from a trough and see some of those people preparing food for the president. And so I guess I, I, I want, I, sometimes I just go on and don't answer the question, but no. I'm not ruled by disappointment because one, I know that things have gotten better and things will get better. It doesn't free us from the need to continually be engaged and involved. But it's not a whoa, whoa, me involvement. It was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. What's gonna happen next involvement? And so, no, I'm not disappointed because I know, and people often say this is almost cliche. We got, we got a long way to go. We come a long way, but we got a long way to go. But that's true. But enjoy the ride. Frederick, you are fantastic. We have loved meeting you. Thank you so much. Um, Akbar, you are equally fantastic. And I have loved working with you and getting to know you over this, the past couple of weeks. I'm so grateful that you shared your time and your experience with us. Um, you have brought to life a character that um, I personally didn't know enough about. And I am just 
uh, delighted to have uh, gone on this journey and learned more. Okay, well, you're very welcome. And I deeply appreciate the opportunity. And for everyone that's watching, thank you for tuning in and take care. Okay. One final announcement, folks, in two weeks, we will have Jennifer Keishan Armstrong to speak with us. She has written a fantastic book called The Women or When Women Invented Television. And she features four groundbreaking women. Um, Betty White is one of them. Uh, Erna Phillips, who basically pretty much invented the soap opera. Uh, Gertrude Berg, who was the writer uh, for the show, the Goldbergs, uh, the Goldbergs and Hazel Scott uh, was the first African American to host a national variety show. So it's a really well researched, um, excellent book, easy to read, and um, Jennifer was uh, a, one of the guests when um, we had, uh, when Mark Larson gave his presentation about Ed Asner, she was one of the um, featured guests. So she uh, comes with a lot of authority and knowledge about popular culture. And I hope you will join us in two weeks. Akbar, thank you so much. Everyone have a great, uh, a great couple of weeks, stay safe. And uh, we will talk to you soon. Thank you.